Welcome to the Teamwork Advantage podcast with Greg Gregory. Join us as Greg interviews powerful thought leaders and successful team and leadership experts from across the country on teamwork, leadership, and organizational culture. Now let's check in for this week's episode. Welcome back, everybody, to the Teamwork Advantage. I am Greg Gregory, your host for this week's episode. We're excited to have with us, uh, in my mind, a little bit of a uh, legend because, well, he's been inducted into the Washington, D.C. Sports Hall of Fame back in July of 2016 in recognition of his work as play-by-play role for both the NBA's Washington Bullets, now the Wizards, and the NFL Washington football team. But he's probably best known for his 25 years with the Washington team, where he described football team's finest era. That's an era that included four Super Bowl appearances and three NFL championships. Three championships, by the way, with one coach, but three different quarterbacks. We're sure we're going to get into that conversation a little bit today. His work didn't stop there. Frank was a reporter as well as a news anchorman for sports director and sports reporter for both the ABC and CBS television stations in Washington, D.C. He also worked for the CBS television network, providing play-by-play for both college and basketball teams for three years. As his career turned towards its conclusion, he anchored the news at WTOP Radio, Washington's all-news station, while appearing in a number of motion pictures as an extra including speaking roles in Step Up and National Treasure Book of Secrets with Nicolas Cage. And I just saw that a couple of weeks ago, and I saw Frank's picture in there and saw his piece. That was awesome. I often talk about how sports implies uh, great teams, and we all know that. And so often people think teamwork when they think sports, and they think sports when they think teamwork. But what I want to do today is talk with Frank about some of the sports things that have happened in his life and what he's witnessed. And we'll talk about how that might transition into your business worlds along the way. Welcome, Frank Herzog, former voice of the Washington football team. Hello, Frank. Hi, Greg, it's good to talk to you. And good I must talk. tell you right from the start, after I got off the phone conversation with you, I looked in the mirror and said, what the hell are you gonna talk about? <laughs> <laughs> this program will run all of three minutes. And then the longer I sat there and thought about it, some ideas started to pop into my head. So hopefully we'll get more than three minutes out of this today. Oh, I think we will. I think we will. One of the things I often talk about is, well, before we know where we're going, we got to know where we are. Before we know where we are, we got to know from whence we came. And teamwork is something that's not new. It's not hard. It's evolved. So I want to talk with you a little bit about some of those things in there and the value of teamwork. And when did you first start to understand what teamwork is all about? You know, I think it came probably with the Washington Bullets. Um, Mm -hmm. And it it came after they had won a championship. We were at a reunion dinner at the Palm Restaurant. Abe Poland had us all there. And at one point, General Manager Bob Ferry got up and said, You know, I told people when you guys were playing in 1978 that there wasn't enough talent on this team to win an NBA championship. And all the players kind of nodded like, yeah, they knew he'd said that. And I thought, wow, what an interesting thing to say to your team. And then I thought about it and I said, if you want to talk about teamwork, perhaps they are one of the best examples I've seen because they did not have the talent to be an NBA champion. The talent they had was getting older, and they had a bunch of new guys. Mm -hmm. Uh, People forget that when they made the playoffs, they were a wild card team. Uh, They had to win a a three-game series against the Atlanta Hawks to advance. And somehow, during the playoffs, it all came together, and they won. They won a championship. And I, to this day, believe that the reason they won was every player did his job and didn't try to do any more. Exactly. And I think a key to teamwork is that. Um, Kevin Grevy shot the ball. He didn't rebound. Elvin Hayes shot the ball and rebounded. Wes Unseld didn't <laughs> shoot the ball. He rebounded. rebounded. And they had this combination of players that Dick Mata could throw together in, di- in different combinations, and they could win. Uh, that was the first instance that I saw where teamwork made a difference. And interestingly, 
it carried him to the NBA Finals the next year, but Seattle wanted some revenge, and that's the end of that story. <laughs> when we chatted on the phone, <clears throat> excuse me, you had mentioned something about a, a concept that Dick Mata used in that series of knowing when to substitute players and how to put certain players into positions. What did you call that? Matchup. Okay. It's something that uh, developed uh, probably before Mata. It had been developing for a couple of years. But the NBA stopped being uh, a league where it's just run up and down the floor and throw up shots or go to your best player. And they started talking about who can we match up against this guy to play better than him? And how do we do those matchups? And it got to the point where Mata, would, they would scout a team before they played them. And they'd come up with three, maybe four plays that they thought would work specifically for that team. They go out on the floor in the first quarter and he would run those plays and they would see how they worked. And if they worked, he wouldn't run them again until the last four minutes of the game. And suddenly <laughs> out came those plays and they would win. Um, so Mata was crafty about this. He, he had, because of his extensive college ex and, and pro experience, he had a great way of taking people and putting them in the game at the right time and getting the most out of them. And I think the players responded to that. He had the, the big resolute team with Unseld, Hayes, Dandridge, Kevin Greeby, Tom Henderson. They would go in and just pound you to death. And about the time you got tired and they got a little winded, in would come the speed group with Larry Wright and Mitch Kupchak and Charles Johnson and Greg Ballard. And they would rip up and down the floor. And by the time they were done, you were absolutely gassed. And he used all of those combinations to put together a team that was a winner. Mm -hmm. Sounds a little bit like what Herb Brooks did with the 1980 U.S. hockey team. Precisely. Yeah, and <clears> they, how he got and, them and conditioned. In, <clears throat> excuse me. The thing is, they bought into it. Mm -hmm. You know, at first they were a little put off by him. Some of them were insulted. Some of them were gone. But the ones who remained bought into it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big key to teamwork. Well, that's it. It's, it's not about, you know, there's a friend of mine who does sales trading, and he's often been known to say, everybody in the world loves to buy, but no one wants to be sold. So when a player feels like he's being sold something, he or she may just bolt. Right. And that's not the type of person you want on a team anyway. Exactly. You know? um, yeah. One of the great books I've read over the years is a, called Good to Great by Jim Collins. And in that book, he talks about you got to get the right people on the bus, get them in the right seats. And yes, you got to get the wrong ones off the bus. And that sounds like kind of what Mata did back then. Exactly. Got some of the wrong ones off the bus and put everybody else into the right seats. Yep. That's uh, at the same time, I was working at, uh, I went over, to, when the bullets were done, I went over to Channel 9 mm -hmm. and began working with Glenn Brenner. And it was a entirely different team atmosphere. He was the guy in charge. He was the star of the show, and rightly so. And everything that was done by the rest of the team in the sports department was to help him. Mm -hmm. And it was a completely different atmosphere. And it took me a little while to get used to it and to understand it. But later down the line, it would translate over when I went and became a sports director at the ABC affiliate. And mm -hmm. suddenly, I was in his position and wondering what I'm going to do. And I'll tell you more about that later, but I want to get mm -hmm. ahead of myself. Yeah. Now, and that's absolutely fascinating there when we start to recognize how teamwork starts to come together. Uh, we had uh, former NBA player Mark Eaton on a few weeks ago, and he's talking the same thing about how it was everybody knew what they had to do. And, you know, Mark was seven foot four inches tall, or is, and, uh, you know, he, he wasn't the type of guy who'd be a speedster up and down the court and shooting. He knew where his position was as a big guy. And understanding what your position is on every team. You know, if you're an intern in an office, your job is to be the intern. Don't overstep your boundaries. Now, it's interesting because in my experience doing the NBA, I don't think I can count on one hand. I don't think there's that many teams that won – with a superstar player and nothing else. Michael Jordan, okay, he was a great player, 
It was the team. But he though. didn't start winning until he got Scottie Pippen and Dennis Rodman, mm-hmm. Steve Kerr, and the rest of that crew. Right. Uh, and I think it's the same. I, I, I tried hard. I can't think of a team. Oscar Robertson was a great player and played for years and never won anything. It wasn't until he got to Milwaukee and was joined by a kid named Lou Alcindor that they began to win and he won, and he won a title. Uh, the Chicago Bulls are a perfect example of this, Craig. Yes. Uh, let me take people back to probably before they were born. 1997, the Bulls were playing the Utah Jazz in the NBA championship. Is game six. The Bulls wanted to win it because they didn't want to go back to Utah. They came down to the final few seconds, and they needed a shot, and they called timeout. And they sat in the huddle, and I've seen the video of this. Mm -hmm. Jordan's sitting there, and he says, look, everybody in the house knows you're coming to me. So he looked at Steve Kerr, and he said, when I get the ball, I'm getting it to you. Make the shot. And Kerr said, okay. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I remember that. I was thinking about Steve Kerr. What? How would you feel if Michael Jordan turns to you and says, you're getting the ball, you make the shot. Would there be any pressure on you? <laughs> but for Steve Kerr, he was merely asked to do what he was there to do. He, was he had a done a thousand team. times before. Yeah, and he was a great one. And he, he had pressure before. So he makes the shot, the Bulls win the title. Yeah. <laughs> Now, basketball is a wholehearted team, constant up and down the court sport. When we move over to football, it's still a definite team sport. You know, you've got your special teams, you've got your uh, offense, you've got your, for that matter, you've got your backfield team and front line team and all of that. How is teamwork different in football and how does that go? And then how did you make the transition from basketball to football? Well, watching football, uh, it took a while. Luckily, I had Sam Huff alongside me the first two years, and then Sam Huff and Sonny Jurgensen. Mm-hmm. And so I probably learned as much about football off, off the air before the game and after the game from them than I did during the game. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that struck me there, Greg, is that uh, in basketball, you can have an off night and still win if you're a player. Doesn't work at football. Mm-hmm. Tell, tell a couple of offensive linemen that they have a bad game, chances are you're going to lose. Same with a quarterback, wide receivers, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think that there, the teamwork was probably more critical in football than in any other sport to the point that I developed, a, I developed a saying at the end of every Washington touchdown. Uh, I'd say touchdown Washington Redskins. And it became a habit, and it was, it was musical, and I liked it. But the reason I, I first thought of that was how it struck me that everybody on that team had to do his job on that play to get that guy in the end zone. If Otis Wansley doesn't make his block on the middle linebacker, if Russ Grimm doesn't get a piece of Randy White, if George Stark doesn't pull around and, and get outside and run that, that quarterback off, Riggins doesn't get in. Um, it, was, it was everybody. Yeah. And I think uh, and then you looked at the defensive side of the ball, and it was the same thing. If guys were playing and they were all together and they were doing their job, they were fine. Yeah. Now, why do you think they bought into that concept? Because in the uh, early 70s, George Allen had the over-the-hill gang, and they did pretty well. They got to a Super Bowl. Of course, they lost to the uh, undefeated Miami Dolphins that year. But later on, when now we're talking into the, uh, you know, the late 70s, moving into the, through the 1980s, it was a little different. What made that difference? I think football evolved. Uh, I think like the NBA, it became more of a coach's sport. Um, suddenly, coaches were devising game plans and trying to set up matchups. <laughs> Just yep. like the NBA. They knew if Art Monk could get a coach, get – that defensive back to cover him one-on-one, he could beat the guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think they worked very hard to create situations where that would occur. That's why you saw the change in pro football from the quarterback calling the plays and running the offense 
to the coaches on the sidelines signaling in the play they wanted. Mm -hmm. Because in that case, they knew what the play was going to be. They could look at the, at the, at the uh, pictures of it and the videotape instantly and see what worked and what the defense was doing and how to counter it. It became a much more technical game and a much more coach-oriented game itself. And because it became that way, it became understanding your position. You do what you've got to do, and they're not having to think. They become part of a system. Exactly. You know what's going to happen. You mm -hmm. know what you're asked to do. You're not asked to do anything superhuman. They yeah. don't put you in a position where they're asking you to do something you can't do. Right. And that's, it's because they've practiced it too, again. Exactly. Again and again and again. It's become such to the point that it's habit. When this happens, that happens. When that happens, this happens. It's an all if-then process. And that applies in business as well, I'm assuming. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so let's look. The Washington football team, then, of course, called the Washington Redskins, won three Super Bowls, three different quarterbacks, now, I want to just step back in here. Let me have a little fan moment with you. I used to, there was a thing in Washington, D.C., for those listening outside of the D.C. metropolitan area or outside of the United States, it was always a uh, thing that we would turn down the volume on our television sets and listen to the play-by-play -play on radio because of the way that Frank Herzog would call that play. He would say something like, the Redskins have the ball. They're on their own 30-yard line. They're moving left to right across your radio dial. You could picture <laughs> everything that happened. And I just thought that was so incredible. I could close my eyes and see the game. So communication is, a, is critical. Where did that whole concept for you come from? And then how did that work with the Washington team as they started to evolve a little bit? So let's kind of take two birds with that one. Well, the, the, the volume on the TV down and the radio up is a ph phenomenon that happened because the Redskins early on were bad. Um, in the early years with Jack Pardee and then the first couple of years with, with uh, Joe Gibbs, when CBS televised the games, and they always televised the games, they didn't put their number one team there. You didn't see Pat Summerall and John Madden at the side of a Redskins game. It was... Harry Black and Joe Wutzix, uh, two guys you never heard of, who did the game for television. And as a result, fans would sit and listen to them and go, what are these guys talking about? They don't know the Redskins. And they would get insulted. So they, somebody would say, turn on the radio. Let's see what those guys are doing. And of course, we knew the Redskins because we had them every week. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's just steamrolled after a while. And to its credit, the radio station marketed the idea pretty well, too. Right. They started running promos saying, hey, turn down the sound. <clears throat> and as a result, it worked very well to the point that when Madden and Summerall used to come in to do the games, they knew they had competition. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there in and of itself is, is another team. I mean... Yeah, You've got Frank Herzog, Sam Huff, and Hall of, Hall of Famer Sam Huff, and Hall of Famer Sonny Jurgensen, right there in the booth. And that's a team. How did you all mesh? Um, Sam and I got along, I think, from the get-go, because Sam was a veteran broadcaster. Mm -hmm. um, and we worried, I think there was some concern about Sonny coming in as a third body in the booth. Um, but what people didn't realize is that I had worked – gosh, two or three years with Sonny uh, on Channel 9. He and I had worked together. I got to know him. Uh, we even did, we did college basketball together. Most people don't know that, but on television, we did Maryland games. Yes. In fact, I'm sorry, Greg, I'll throw you this. I just thought of it. We did the first televised game ever at the Air Force Academy, Maryland against Air Force. Wow. Uh, it was a, that was a nightmare. <laughs> but so Sonny and I had worked together. And then the final ingredient was that people didn't know. Sonny and Sam were friends and had been roommates in training camp. Vince Lombardi made them roommates. With the I do remember that, seeing that, yes. With the theory that once they got, talk, got done talking about cars and women, they would begin to talk about football. And Sonny would understand how a linebacker thought and Sam would have a better idea of what the quarterback was thinking. 
And they both lived in Northern Virginia, right off the, the George Washington Parkway. So it became routine that Sonny would pick Sam up and was, they went to the games. So you had real close friends, you had acquaintances that knew each other and bang. It took, it took maybe eight minutes, the first game for the three of us to get comfortable. Then after that, it was just wide open. And I and got, again, and and again, everybody knew on, I got the best job in the world. Are you kidding me? <laughs> You're sitting in a bar and you got a Hall of Famer on one side and a Hall of Famer on the other talking about the game. Now, can you beat that? No. Nah. Nah. And that's, that's another team. Everybody knew what their job was in that box, too. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I, I had to learn mine uh, where, where my boundaries were. I would, early on, I would say uh, the offense would complete a pass. And I'd say, that was a nice play. And Sam would say, that wasn't a nice play. The defense made a mistake. And then the defense would make a play. And I'd say, well, that was a great defensive play. And Sonny would say, that wasn't a great defensive play. The offense screwed that up. He passed to the wrong guy. So I said to myself, Frank, you just better shut up about your analysis of the plays and let them do their jobs. Yep. Well, so once I learned that, it was a lot easier. Yeah. So let's talk about the Washington team back in those days. As I said, three Super Bowls, three Super Bowl victories, three different quarterbacks. Why? How did, Joe Gibbs is the only coach to have accomplished that in NFL history. I think because – Gibbs was willing to mold the system around the player, to, to alter the system to bring out the player's strengths. If this was the quarterback he was going with, and the quarterback was very good at rolling out and throwing passes or moving in the pocket and throwing passes, if he was very good working short crossing patterns and quick ins and outs, his name was Joe Theismann, and that's the plays you gave him. Mm -hmm. uh, and you th throw an occasional long ball, but you didn't see a lot of those from Theismann. No. Theismann became very, very effective. Then along comes Doug Williams, and it's a whole different ball game because Doug Williams likes to go deep, and mm -hmm. he's a great deep ball thrower. Oh, he's got an incredible arm. Yeah, and he's a big guy, and, mm -hmm. but he's not – He's not going to be moving around, rolling out. He's not going to be scrambling. You're going to find him right there in the pocket. So the offense had to adjust. They had to work on their protection plans for their quarterback and beef them up and then go deep. And for Mark Rippon, boy, I don't know what to tell you there, Greg. I, he, he threw a good long ball. He threw a good short ball. He threw a lot of outside passes. And he was smart. And I think that they capitalized on that. But I think the key to the whole thing was the coaches looked and said, this is what the guy can do. This is what he can't do. We're not going to ask him to do those things he can't do. We're going to put him in a position to, we're going to, their line, I think Gibbs's line was, we're going to put them in a position to succeed. That's the whole idea. Right. And they did. And it's, it's fascinating because, again, you're getting to the same point, whether you realize it or not there, that everybody understood their roles. And once they understood what role they were doing, then they could get into it. The quarterback knew what his job was. The lineman said, okay, our job is to protect. We don't have to worry about our quarterback running out of the pocket if we're doing this. Right. And that's, that's so critical across the boards. You know, and, and again, the same thing in business. If we've got a design team, let the design team do it. If we're looking at an information technology team, uh, a development team, they develop, but yet they have to work with the operations team. Now, they can communicate with each other to make sure the software works, and they better, but ops should not tell dev how to do their job, and dev should not tell ops how to do their job. They just need to be able to work together. The other thing, the other strength for the Redskins was uh, the hierarchy. You had Gibbs on top. You had a great assistant coaching staff mm -hmm. who knew that Gibbs would set, he would set the tempo. He would set the game plan. They would come up with ideas and come up and talk about plays, but it was Gibbs who finalized the whole thing. And then their job simply was simple. Just go, go take care of your portions of the team and get them to understand this is what you're going to do and make it work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, 
you eventually moved into and were doing uh, anchor work and news production work. Um, how did some of the things you learned from being on the field, interviewing some of the greatest football players and coaches of all time, how did that turn for you? How did that come about? And how did you, were you able to apply that into your, you know, your leadership roles uh, within the television stations? Uh, well, brace yourself for a longer story. Okay. But, <laughs> uh, when, I went, when I went to the ABC affiliate, I went as the sports director. And I had been in an atmosphere where your sports director, everything fed to him and mm -hmm. made him look good. And I was doing that for a while. And we were doing feature stuff. And one week, we, it came up, we need, uh, our editor left, and we needed a new editor to put pieces together. And my producer said, I know this guy in Baltimore who's living with his parents. He's a little weird, but he's a really good editor. We should give him a try. And I said, okay, why don't you send him down here? Have him come down on Monday when I get back and I'll talk to him. So that weekend, I'd found out that uh, the Redskins were playing a preseason game against the Patriots in New England. And I found out that two America's Cup yachts were practicing for the America's Cup off the coast of Rhode Island. Oh, wow. So I made some phone calls and got permission to go ahead and go up and photograph the thing. So the next thing I know on Saturday afternoon, I'm on a 52-foot Hatteras powerboat. My photographer is all the way out on the prow with his 30-pound camera shooting these two boats, one of which happens to be Courageous, the Ted Turner boat that won the cup. And they're okay. sailing like crazy, and it is gorgeous. And I'm scared to death he's going to fall off and drop that camera that's cost $60,000. But we made it through it. And we came back, and that, we came back that Sunday night. And on Monday, I went into the office, and I said, okay, I know what I need to write as far as a script goes for this story. I need to make it real simple and real short. Right. So I wrote it, and I recorded it. Then this guy comes in to interview for the editing job. And we talked for about five minutes and I said, would you like to edit something? And he said, sure. I said, here. I handed him four tapes. I said, this is the story. I told him briefly what the story was. And I said, have a ball. And I left it at that, figuring that it was a, it was a story that we were not gonna edit right away. We were going to work on during the week. So what he did with it didn't really make any difference. Right. Then we still got the tapes. We still got the pictures. We're good. Mm -hmm. The next day he comes in and I said, let me see the piece. And he plays it. And it's like three minutes and 15 seconds long. And I'm watching. And it gets done. And I look at him and I said, would you play that again, please? So he rewound it and played it again. Greg, I couldn't believe it. He made a movie. It was unbelievable how good this thing was. And there were, he used like three different pieces of music to help illustrate stuff. The way he used and mixed the photographs and mixed the bites from the captain and everything and my voiceover, it was stunning. So I hired him. And right then started an evolution in the way I approached television sports. And that was, if you've got people who are talented and who are enthusiastic and interested in their craft, they'll do the job for you. Yes. You don't have to stand there and micromanage the whole thing. So eventually it became a thing of, this story is going to happen. Why don't you guys go cover it? And I told this one producer one time, he just reminded me this the other day. I told him one time, every time you go out on a story, look around, because there's always a second story. The story you go, behind the gonna, story. You're going to go shoot this football story, but you look around, you may see something else. And every time he went out, it happened. So after a while, I just got to sit back and worry about my sportscast and what I was doing and let those guys do their thing on their own. And we wound up having probably the most talented group of sports people that I'd ever worked with. 
eventually when I went back to the CBS affiliate and was finally promoted up to sports director there, they were still in their old system and I wasn't smart enough to stop it and put the new one in. I didn't think of it. And that's the biggest mistake I made. If I'd done that again, we could have really had something good. And I could tell you today the changes I would have made to make that, that, pro that product better. Forgive me here. There was a little bit of a clip out in the audio on that last piece, and I want you to go back. I kind of know what you said, but I want you to go back. When you went back over to the CBS station, you said you weren't, you didn't make the changes. Yeah, I went back in and I said, I went back in as the number two guy, and mm -hmm. then I got promoted to the number one guy. And so the system was there and it was grinding along. It was the old system that had been used years before with Brenner. Mm -hmm. And I didn't change it. I, I wasn't smart enough to do that. Right. And I wasn't smart enough to say, this photographer should be our lead guy because he's creative and because he loves to do it. And this producer should be doing this and that. Right. And just, you know, change the whole thing. And yeah. it's the biggest mistake I made. Right. I regret it to this day because I think we could have made something special there. But for some reason, I just didn't think of it. Right. Well, that goes back. One of the things I teach in my training workshops, when I go out to a client's site and I'm working with leaders, I have, uh, you just illustrated that right there with your, um, the gentleman you hired as an editor. And it was, there's four levels. There's somebody who has low skill, low will. Hopefully we never hire those, but a lot of employers will, you know, inherit somebody. Then you've got a high skill, but a low will. They may be somebody fresh out of college, doesn't have the experience yet, but they've got the, the drive to do it. But then you get somebody who's got a high skill, but a low will, they're kind of burned out. And they need direction. They need to find their spark again. And then you get that person you found has high skill and high will. And when you've got them in those positions the right way, your leadership job actually becomes easier, doesn't it? And my point here that I'd like to emphasize is you get somebody who's looks like they're enthusiastic but are certainly talented and turn them loose say this is what i want at yep. once they understand the concept of what you're doing say go get them mm -hmm. and just sit back and watch i had a boss one time who made the channel nine in the news department back in that era the number one news station in washington and one time i went into his office and kind of kidding around i said so what's your secret to success jim and he looked at me and he said, are you messing with me or are you serious? And I said, I'm serious. And he said, I don't waste any time firing my mistakes. I've never forgotten that. <laughs> because he brought people in who were enthusiastic, who seemed to be talented. And if they could do it, they stayed. And he would, he would coach them. He would manage them and he'd get them to what he wanted. And if they didn't respond, out the door. Uh, and that's how you find out right off the bat mm -hmm. who you've got. If you give them a chance, turn them loose, let them go do their thing and see what they get. They might surprise you. Right. Now, in, in midst of everything going on today with COVID-19 and people working remotely, over the years, I'm sure you worked with a lot of folks and they, they had to work remotely when they're going out to different sites to right. uh, get different clips. And sometimes you're getting clips from one source over here, but you've got to edit it with your folks over here. How, how was that for you to work with people remotely? And do you see a correlation between, you know, 10, 15, even 30 years ago of the way correlation worked and the way it is today? Well, I think the, the biggest change is probably the advance in technology. Mm -hmm. um, guys, right, when we do live shots, and I'm thinking particularly during a football team's training camp, either, either in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and eventually Frostburg, Maryland, we had a satellite truck that went up and was parked there the whole time. And we had camera crews who came in and one who was there all the time. And a second one would come in and work three or four days, had two or three producers, two pieces of talent. So it was, it was a big deal. And the team at that time was a big deal. Today, I was just talking to, to, to Gerald Owens, who used to anchor Channel 9, who's here in Raleigh. He says he can go live on the air from his cell phone. They don't need a truck. And it's amazing. You know, it's amazing. And tape? Are you kidding me? 
what is tape? Uh, really? We were kidding the other day about having some, some things on tape that were really good. We can't find a place that'll play them. Nobody's got a tape machine left. We're talking about going to the Smithsonian, for God's sake, to get a tape player. And mm -hmm. they might not even have it. I still That's remember the, the great line from the... Whole different world. Yeah, I still remember the great line from uh, when I was a child and the, uh, the gentleman was at Channel 9 TV here in Washington back in the day, Warner Wolf. Yeah. And Warner used to go, let's go to the videotape. <laughs> That's right. Became his trademark. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And, and he so, wrote his, what most people didn't know was he wrote his script on the back of mailing envelopes. <laughs> Go figure. I don't know where that came from. Maybe there was a day when he didn't have any paper and he had to do something, so he jotted it back down. It became a good luck piece. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everybody had their own gear, their own, their, own, mm -hmm. the own, their own way of doing things, and they were superstitious. If it worked, keep doing it. Yes, yes. So let's talk a little bit here now as we get ready to wrap up, because I like to keep this. And by the way, we've hit more than your three-minute timeline. <laughs> I can that. Um, what do you see in teams today? What are you noticing about some of them? For example, I know in San Antonio, um, as for, they, they've had a great run in, in their basketball run. Great teamwork there. What do you see in teams today that are working? Are there, is there anything different? Or is it kind of the same thing, kind of just amplified, I guess? I think uh, teams have changed because of free agency. Mm -hmm. And I think the movement of players and teams' willingness to move them uh, has made a huge difference. And even today, in the last three or four years, you find teams are willing to trade guys or let them go when they still have contracts. Look at uh, Leonard Fournette down in Florida. They, I mean, the team couldn't make a trade for him. They couldn't get what they wanted. So they just cut him with like $14 million left on his contract. So it's, it, that's what's different. San Antonio, Greg Popovich, seems to be holding on to that old concept of a team and mm -hmm. keeping players together and everything else. But it's fading fast. It's not going to last. And as a result, you don't have the same kind of allegiance to a team right. from players that uh, they had when Art Monk and Gary Clark and Joe Theismann were playing. Mm -hmm. And they were strapped down and had no choice to move. Right. You know, I can still remember if you go all the way back to, I think it was 1968, 67, there was the expansion baseball season. And um, the New York Yankees actually put Mickey Mantle up on the expansion draft. Yeah. You know, and of course, nobody took him because they knew he would never play for anybody but the Yankees. Well, it scared the hell out of him because he's going to ask for how much money? All right. <laughs> and at that point, he, he was the first player to sign – Five one hundred thousand dollar year contracts. Yeah, a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> Can you imagine making that much money today? Wow. I think I think the, the manager of a team makes a hundred thousand dollars. Oh, I, 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 I yeah, more than that. It's interesting to talk about this and recognize things because you're you're absolutely right. I think the free agency and things of that nature, and I think the business side at certain areas has broken down the actual entertainment of the game of sports. I do believe that even within the front offices, there are a lot of teams that are really functioning really, really well inside there. It's just not always translating out onto the field. Would you think that's a good point? Yeah, or? yeah I think so. I think the Dallas Cowboys are an excellent example of that. Mm -hmm. Just the facility they have is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and there are other teams, you know, the 49ers, uh, the Packers, look at the Packers, owned by the fans. Yes. And they're still prospering. They're doing very well. They're a very solid group. Um, I th the cynic in me believes the whole atmosphere of pro football has changed. And I think it's a money sport now. I don't think the owners need you to be a fan to make money. All they need to do is sell out those suites and a few season tickets, and they're golden. From the TV revenues. From the TV revenues, absolutely. Yeah, so I think there's less, there's less pressure on the owners to do well. And then you have the few who have huge egos and want to have championship teams and manage to do it. Right. 
Well, I've always said as a great expression, teamwork makes the dream work. And in so many different levels, I think that's true. Uh, in the midst of COVID-19, I think the teams that have come together in hospitals and first responders have just been incredible yeah. with how they work. So just great entertainment listening to you here today, talking about some of the great teams and how their, their strengths are there, you know, and um, the idea of the 1980 hockey team and what they've been able to pull together uh, and how well they're still recognized around the world, I think is just incredible. So I'm excited. Thank you for joining us on the Teamwork Advantage, where we really focus in on those three areas, teamwork, leadership, and culture. And as you talked about today, every one of those teams you mentioned today that were highly successful had great teamwork, had great leadership, and they had the right culture that they were looking for. That's right. And uh, that's, that's so powerful. I, I've referred to that lately as the TLC of business. <laughs> so, so I appreciate your time here on the Teamwork Advantage. Uh, be sure to join us again next week as we bring somebody else in to talk about it from maybe a different aspect in information technology. My name is Greg Gregory. Thank you to Frank Herzog, voice of the Washington Redskins for years and Washington Bullets. Frank, thanks again for joining us here. And as I always say, do not have a good day because having a good day is just being average. And we know that if you're listening to the Teamwork Advantage, you're not an average person. Thanks a lot. Be sure to make it a terrific day. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Teamwork Advantage with Greg Gregory. Be sure to like, subscribe, and activate the bell icon to be notified of future episodes. To learn more about how Greg can help your organization develop a powerful winning culture, visit TeamsRock.com. That's TeamsRock.com.